Okay, I think most everybody is here, and so we're going to go ahead and start. Uh, and let me start by saying that my name is Doris Meissner, and I'm a senior fellow here at the Migration Policy Institute. Very pleased to welcome you all to this um, installment <laughs> of a series that we call Leadership Visions. Uh, Leadership Visions is a series, uh, a speaker series that we have for senior officials in immigration agencies and with immigration related portfolios early on in their tenure to give them an opportunity to talk to the immigration community more generally about how they see what it is that they want to accomplish, what they're facing, and for the immigration community and new leaders to get acquainted. We've hosted um, uh, Ali Mayorkas when he was the head of USCIS. We do not have not had him back since he's been the deputy secretary, but we'll try to do that as well. We've had uh, John Morton here when he was uh, just new in the assistant secretary at ICE position. Alex Elenikoff uh, when he became the deputy commissioner of UNHCR. So though people like that. Uh, this is a session that is being videotaped, and the. Um, Questions that you ask during the Q&A will also be recorded, so the session will be posted on our uh, website for others to access uh, as soon as we can get it up there. Uh, the format is that um, uh, Commissioner Krulikowski will make formal remarks to begin with uh, here from the podium. Then he's going to come back and join me uh, at the front and he and I will have a conversation uh, based on uh, follow-up questions that I will ask and then we'll open it to the audience uh, for Q&A. And um, so keep your notes as you go. So with that backdrop, uh, let me do the formal introductions here of uh, uh, Commissioner Kurlikowski. The Commissioner was sworn in in March, that's just about six months ago, and heads an agency that now numbers about 60,000 employees with a budget of about $12.1 billion. It is today the largest federal law enforcement agency in the government, and it's the second largest revenue producing agency in the federal government. Um, uh, Gil Kurlikowski brings to this position a very distinguished law enforcement career. It's a career that spans 40 years. It began in St. Petersburg, Florida, but it then over time included being police commissioner of Buffalo, New York, uh, chief of police in Seattle, Washington, and along the way becoming recognized as a national leader in community policing. He served twice as president of the major cities uh, chiefs of police association and most recently at the federal level has been director of the White House Office of National Drug Control Policy. Along this route, and Gil, I've been trying to remember when, I don't remember entirely, uh, he and I have become acquainted. We've worked together on a number of different, uh, at a no number of different times and points and um, uh, and what I want to say about that is to just convey to you at a personal level uh, the exceptional professionalism of this individual and uh, per, and he he is a person who has a reputation as one of the nation's most highly respected law enforcement leaders so it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome him here today and to welcome you to the podium thank you Doris very thank much you. thanks well, good afternoon, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's very nice to see uh, uh, a number of friends. I can't thank Doris enough for that uh, for that very kind invitation, and for all of you to be here on actually <laughs> what is an incredibly beautiful day out, and uh, and everybody else would be outside figuring out some type of excuse, but you'd rather be in here listening to a policy lecture, so uh, uh, my hat is off to all of you. Uh, it's a great pleasure also to be here to talk about kind of the, not only the evolving vision for CBP, but uh, to mention and talk a little bit about some of the pressing concerns uh, that really face our agency. Uh, it's always interesting when you go back to uh, 
George H.W. Bush. You listened to, I remember when he talked about the vision thing, uh, et cetera. So you can have these great visions, uh, you can have these great plans, and then life gets in the way. And we've had a few, uh, a, a few struggles, particularly uh, over the summer, and I'll talk about those just a little bit. Well, CBP is the nation's first unified border management agency. And for most of America's history, each of the border functions was done separately. So when you went to a border, uh, you would have someone there from the Border Patrol quite often. You'd have someone maybe doing an agricultural inspection. You'd have someone then from immigration. So after 9-11, after the 9-11 Commission, this uh, CBP was put together to have, as, as people often say, one face at the border. It was created in 2003. Uh, it not only covers our land ports of entry, but also our airports. And we perform the functions for a variety of federal agencies. We've learned and evolved much since the founding of the Department of Homeland Security. And this unified border agency uh, has allowed us to craft a comprehensive border strategy, not only to secure the borders, but also to support the economy. So you often hear the secretary, he'll talk about this, not only this dual role, but the important role that he has, uh, Secretary Johnson, in, in securing the borders, but also in facilitating lawful trade and lawful travel. Really two very important things. Well, let me tell you a little bit about what we are, and kind of what we do. Uh, everything related to people and products that crosses the border uh, via land or air or sea are the things that CBP touches. We process, and I guess I wouldn't be a good federal employee if I didn't give you some statistics and information, but we process about a million passengers and pedestrians at the border every day, 67,000 truck, rail, and sea containers, and we do a lot of other things. We arrest wanted criminals. We seize lots of narcotics every day. We seize illicit currency, uh, often currency that's going back south uh, that would feed cartels. We seize firearms, and so we work at, uh, on, on both directions. And we, and we collect, as Doris said, hundreds of thousands of dollars in customs revenue every single day. So after the ever popular IRS, we're the, uh, we're the second largest revenue collector uh, for the country. And then we have a large uh, workforce that works very hard to protect our agricultural, our agricultural products. The number of pests, and before I got this job I, I probably wouldn't have been able to distinguish a capra beetle from the Asian gypsy moth. Uh, in case you don't know, this is Asian gypsy moth breeding season right now. But there are a number of different uh, pests and diseases that can greatly harm uh, our country's agricultural products. And our folks are out there. The ever popular uh, uh, small beagle that uh, comes and sits down, if they sit down next to your suitcase, it will be a long day for you when you, when, when you return. Uh, so remember not to bring that food back in, uh, back in your bag. So you can really see that whether it's our laboratory sciences division, these agriculture inspectors, uh, a number of people who work on the intellectual property rights can really see that we have a very uh, uh, diverse skill set and a very crucial border management agenda. Well, since I joined in March, I've worked to address a number of critical issues facing the agency. Um, we're leading the agency right now through a series of particular problems, some of which have existed for you know, for quite some time, but I think it kind of gives you a, um, a view of, of what we're dealing with and where we're headed. Uh, experience uh, uh, often does get, uh, that lets you know that as many plans and as many things as you want to accomplish, as incidents and other things occur, you really end up getting uh, diverted to some of those. And let me tell you about one in particular, uh, migrant children and families. 
the border has been and remains actually more secure, the southwest border particularly, more secure than it has in decades. But we have seen this influx of Central American migrants, including unaccompanied children and families, all coming in the Rio Grande Valley, uh, the vast majority in the Rio Grande Valley. So we have a lot more technology, a lot more people, a lot more resources on the border. Uh, the president and the administration set into place as a result of this influx a, a very vigorous and coordinated federal response trying to increase deterrence, enforcement, and our cooperation with foreign countries. And as a result, uh, quite fortunately right now, the number of Central American migrants trying to illegally cross uh, into the south, across the southwest border is really uh, on the decline. Well, that's very good news but there could be a lot of reasons for it. Uh, the weather in particular right now, this is oftentimes a, a lull, as Doris certainly knows, oftentimes a lull in, uh, in illegal migration. But there are a lot of other things going on, and I'm gonna mention a few of them to you. That kind of shows that, uh, that we've had this interagency response uh, to dealing with this. So right now we're, not taking a victory lap. We're very pleased that the numbers are down, um, but we should be very concerned. Uh, let me tell you about a few of the things. First of all, uh, working with Central American leaders, and as you know, the Vice President was in Central America, met with two of the presidents of the three countries, uh, El Salvador and, uh, and Guatemala, uh, about this. Honduras is the other large country where, uh, where these kids are coming from. But also the presidents of those three countries did come to the United States and did meet with uh, uh, President Obama. Uh, we, they have not only been reinforcing the dangers of, of trying to get into the United States, the things that can occur, and I think we're all very familiar with them, but they've been great partners, and that includes uh, in repatriation. Um, all of this, I think that part is contributing to the reduction. Overall, uh, the personnel and the technology and the resources that have been deployed over the last six years uh, have also helped to reduce some of the problem. And as you know, a recent Pew Center report shows that the efforts uh, overall are working. And after a rapid expansion uh, of illegal immigration into the United States, 1990 to 2006, the unauthorized immigrant population has really been very stable since about 2007. Again, a number of factors are at play. Perhaps the sluggish economy, uh, which has also been one of the greatest uh, contributors uh, to, to increases in illegal migration uh, when it's a good economy, when jobs are available. In addition to enhancing enforcement, we launched what we call the Dangers Awareness Campaign. And I think some of you are familiar with that. It's gone on for a number of years. We often go out uh, at the beginning of the, of the very hot summers and tell people how incredibly dangerous it is. Uh, you can lose your life very, very quickly uh, to the environment, but you can also be assaulted, you can be harmed, and that, uh, that campaign has been in, in existence for a number of years. What was different though this year is that we also put into place uh, um, a very strong message in all three of those Central American countries, a very strong message that you would not be permitted to stay if you did in fact uh, make it to the United States. And again, we think this has been helpful. Through radio, print, bus placards, uh, billboards, et cetera. That has hit over 6,700 radio and TV spots in those three countries, uh, over 174 press interviews to major media markets, all trying to get that dual message out. It's not only dangerous, but uh, you will not be allowed to stay. And the administration's response and efforts to work with the Central American leaders to publicize the dangers of the journey and to reinforce that the uh, immigrants will not be allowed really and will in fact be detained and will in fact be returned home. And there are a number of flights that occur every week back to those three Central American countries. 
the Department of Homeland Security dedicated uh, historic levels of personnel uh, and resources to this issue. Today, right now, there are 18,000 Border Patrol agents along the southwest border. That was compared to about 15,000 back in 2008. Fencing and barriers have doubled. There are unmanned aircraft systems that have more than doubled nationwide. Uh, the ground surveillance systems have all doubled, uh, and they're all devoted to securing the border. Well, taken as a whole, uh, this additional staffing and technology resources over the last six years has helped to reduce the problem. And it's clear from every measure that the approach is working. A number of factors are in play, but one of the greatest contributors is the strong enforcement on the southwest border. In addition to increasing the capacity uh, across the border, we've also made it, uh, we have a, a more mobile or more flexible workforce so that we can move them uh, much more quickly. And in fact, we deployed about uh, about 300 Border Patrol agents to the Rio Grande Valley where the majority of this problem was occurring. Uh, I've expressed uh, on, a, on a number of occasions uh, a second tenet besides the, the border security issue and the unaccompanied children, and that is one about it, transparency and integrity and accountability. Um, and the secretary could not have made that clear. Uh, whenever possible, I am going to continue to side uh, with transparency and openness. Um, along with that transparency comes uh, renewed trust um, and, and our quest to make sure that uh, we improve in that, uh, in that trust and that relationship with, uh, with all the people that we deal with. Uh, it also is important for our employees to do the same thing. And by being accountable, we maintain the integrity of the agency and really we maintain the integrity of the U.S. government. Uh, Secretary Johnson delegated, and we announced it last Thursday, the fact that we would now have uh, investigative authority. So it's interesting that as the, as the Commissioner of Customs and Border Protection, as Doris mentioned, 60,000 employees, we did not have the authority to investigate complaints uh, within the organization. We now have that authority, and uh, uh, a number of new programs are underway to use that authority. We're converting internal affairs employees uh, from general investigators now to be criminal investigators. We've issued an integrity and personal accountability strategy. Uh, we're working in the areas of prevention, detection, investigation, and response to corruption and misconduct. And the strategy establishes a new review procedure for all incidents involving the use of force by Border Patrol agents. Actually, use of force by all agents uh, and officers within Customs and, and Border Protection, including uh, an interagency board that will review the use of force. We want to be able to respond quickly to incidents and we want to be able to get a message out uh, within parameters as to what occurred. Uh, too often I think our response had been no comment or this is under investigation. We need to be able to give people the basic facts about something that has occurred. Uh, we're conducting a feasibility study, as some of you know, on the use of uh, body-worn cameras. We're testing some of those beginning October 1st at our training facility in Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, the cameras can protect officers from unfounded allegations um, and, uh, and can be quite helpful in giving additional information or additional evidence uh, about something that's occurred. And again, this is a feasibility study. Remember that uh, Border Patrol agents uh, work in, in some pretty difficult terrain, so we have to make sure that the equipment that, uh, that we're looking at, the equipment that we're purchasing, is actually going to work. I also announced an integrity advisory panel. Uh, two well-respected leaders in the law enforcement uh, arena have agreed to co-chair this panel and we'll be naming other people shortly. But the former administrator of the United States Drug Enforcement Administration, Karen Tandy, and the current commissioner of the New York City Police Department, Bill Bratton, they'll lead a panel of respected names, not only in law enforcement, but in other disciplines. Uh, the panel will recommend best practice other ways to assist uh, myself as commissioner and really CBP in realizing our potential to improve 
workforce integrity. And the policies of openness uh, don't come easily to any agency. We have been soundly and roundly criticized for that lack of transparency. Um, but the policies of being more open and more transparent end up in the long run, at least in my opinion, in protecting the agency and at least uh, giving voice uh, to the facts about a particular incident. Oftentimes we will see a lot of comments, not too many comments from us. Well, the responsible use of force requires that all of the agents uh, understand the legal considerations and they have to reaffirm their commitment in the integrity strategy to doing the right thing both on and off duty. And we have a responsibility to ensure, and I have a responsibility to ensure that they have the training, the guidance, and the equipment they need so that we can be held accountable. On May 30th, we released a revised, publicly, a revised use of force policy that had not been done. We released a policy or a uh, consultant study from the Police Executive Research Forum uh, that was highly critical of, uh, of Border Patrol use of force. That was released publicly and we have reviewed uh, all of the different comments and the concerns and are working hard to fix that also. Uh, this new use of force and a new use of force policy, a new integrity strategy are just uh, additional steps toward greater accountability and transparency. Let me mention just a couple other things. Uh, partnerships and information sharing are at the heart of what we do, whether it's through our international agreements where we have pre-clearance in places like Canada and Abu Dhabi, uh, to working with importers and exporters, particularly through a trusted traveler programs and uh, trusted trader programs. Well, I envision an agency that uh, will use these relationships and an agency that understands the importance of collaboration is one that takes us all moving forward. Uh, I've traveled, I think, in the six months almost every week, um, meeting people all over the world that work for us. We have a footprint, by the way, in about 40 countries, we have attaches in 23 countries. So we do have a worldwide footprint. I continually hear from my colleagues around the world that they're very interested in learning more about what we're doing and how we can be helpful to them. And that's something that we can export. That's something that uh, we don't sell. That's something that we're happy to provide them not only with uh, uh, the information about what we've learned, but also the mistakes that we've made. Uh, the border security extends far beyond the physical borders and the pre-clearance is, is kind of what we call pushing the border out. Uh, working with industry partners, we've established networks that receive information on the arriving international partners and cargo. Uh, we've been uh, able to use our automated targeting systems to screen arrivals at the earliest possible points uh, before uh, they could do harm here in the United States. We have a, an extensive interagency collaboration that allows for these travel and trade and exporting partners and importing partners uh, from multiple agencies to sit side by side. CBP uh, uh, enforces the laws and the regulations for over 40 federal agencies. So whether it's the uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission or the uh, Food and Drug Administration, our people that are on the front lines as cargo and including air cargo uh, come in, our people are on the front lines and they have to be familiar with a wide array of laws. They have to have uh, good collaboration, good information sharing in order to, uh, uh, to enforce those laws and not only to keep products uh, from harm uh, or keep uh, people from uh, harm from some of those products that are being imported, but uh, those are all important duties and it requires a great deal of, uh, of, of close working uh, relationship with these other agencies. As the technology expands faster, more secure information sharing, we can't lose sight of those partnerships, we can't lose sight of those relationships. As you also know, uh, or many of you know, uh, every year the federal government does a, an employee morale survey. Uh, every year the morale within the Department of Homeland Security is often uh, shown as, as being particularly low. 
helping to improve that I think is a, a critical part of my job. Uh, one of the areas that uh, I know I could be doing better in is making sure that employees know that uh, the work that they do is valued, that they're recognized, and that they're appreciated. And so as I travel around the country or travel around the world uh, and meet with them, I always try to make sure that they actually know that. Uh, Secretary Johnson and the Deputy Secretary uh, that had been here before, Deputy Secretary Ali Mayorkas, uh, have made improving uh, employee morale an important, uh, an important issue, whether it's through recognition programs uh, or, uh, uh, or, or other ways that we can show our appreciation for the work that they do. Um, Better communication. You can never communicate enough as a leader uh, within an organization. Advancing the online career center. People that want transfers, people that uh, would like a promotion, people that would like an opportunity to maybe do something else within the organization, they should have that information where they can apply and they can look at that and perhaps then do something else. Meeting with these people and the, uh, with our folks in these stops and having these town hall style meetings has been not, not only, I think, uh, uh, helpful in communicating, I think it's really been quite helpful in educating me. And really, I have to tell you, wherever I've traveled and, uh, and met with our folks, their knowledge is supreme, their professionalism is very good. I think that... Uh, Watching the way the Border Patrol agents on my five trips to McAllen, Texas, uh, watching the way the Border Patrol agents dealt with these young people, uh, oftentimes children, uh, was really very, uh, very impressive to me. Um, the care and the tenderness that they, uh, that they showed uh, was remarkable. And during those early days uh, with this influx, uh, they were bringing in um, clothing or toys or things from their own families to share with these kids. That's a story that's not often told. Um, well, I've mentioned a lot of challenges. I've mentioned the fact that we have an outstanding workforce. Um, it's an incredibly busy time for us, not only in securing the economy, but in securing the border. And to have this opportunity to be with you, to have a chance uh, uh, to engage with you, uh, is, uh, is something that, uh, that I'm most honored by. So thank you very much. So we're going to dig into a couple of them a little more and maybe find a couple of other issues. Um, the description that you gave us of what you're doing on the issues of use of force and uh, uh, overall transparency have really become, uh, I think, signature items for you in the, in the short period that you've been here. Um, so uh, given the importance of these issues in a law enforcement agency, I'd be very interested to know whether you came into the agency with the idea that these issues needed to be addressed, or are they things that you reacted to based on, uh, uh, you know, based on what you found? Are they part of something that you see as an essential first step? or are they a response to uh, uh, issues that arose when you arrived? When, uh, during the five years that I, I served the president as his drug policy advisor, you know, you'd often get asked about, well, do you know people uh, that might want or should you know, be, be thought of for a particular position, some of the different law enforcement agencies? I'd always try to be very helpful, et cetera. Uh, when the president's uh, uh, counselor asked, uh, do you know anybody for CBP? I <laughs> said, yes, what about me? And uh, I, I very much had the chance during, the, during those five years to write what's called the Southwest Border County Narcotics Strategy. So I had this opportunity to work with people from CBP quite a bit. Uh, I had a, a very good uh, 
sense of the organization, uh, not only its strengths but also uh, its weaknesses. Uh, the concerns about transparency, the concerns that have been voiced about use of force were ones well known to me, but I think with a law enforcement background, I also, uh, I, I think I'm particularly well suited uh, uh, to take this issue on and to be held accountable. And that's, uh, uh, I knew it coming in. Mm -hmm. Maybe that doesn't say much about my ability to forecast. <laughs> how, 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 how are these initiatives being received within the organization? Well, I've met with the upper management levels throughout the Border Patrol, both out in the field and also within headquarters. And that's where the majority of the use of force issue it does occur with the Border Patrol, given where they work and, and, uh, and the hours. Uh, and I'd say it's being received very well. But I've also had a chance to sit down with agents that are in the training classes, uh, brand new agents that have just been hired, and talk about this. I don't think there's any job right now that is coming under more scrutiny in this country than line level law enforcement. And it's really up to the people that are in those leadership positions uh, of those org organizations uh, to fix the problem. And part of the fix, of course, is being more open about what we've done and what we've done correctly. And also, of course, when we've made mistakes, being more open to admitting those. Okay. Um, Something that's obviously so in the news now in recent days, of course, is the ISIL and the uncertainty in the Middle East. And um, we find that in our own political discourse, as soon as an issue like this arises and it's happening again, sometimes our elected officials like to allege that uh, uh, we have porous borders and therefore we are vulnerable to terrorism from abroad. Um, could you talk about CBP's role where anti-terrorism is concerned, particularly in light of the current situation, and um, uh, uh, and just, you know, uh, very straightforwardly, should we be fearing ISIL on our own territory? So we have not one hint of credible information that ISIS or ISIL is poised or is coming across the southwest border, none whatsoever. Uh, that being said, over 400,000 people have been apprehended trying to get into this country. Uh, that represents over 140 countries. Uh, people that are apprehended are debriefed. Their uh, biometric information, fingerprints, photographs, etc., those are all taken. Uh, that information is checked against a variety of databases and we need to make sure that with the other interagency federal colleagues that, uh, that we're sharing that information. Uh, and taking a look at it. So I think there, there's always the concern, but I think it's important to recognize that uh, uh, given the fact that we have a lot more resources, uh, a lot more technology that has been devoted to, to securing the border, uh, uh, that we're in much better shape now than we were in the past. You know, it's always been interesting to me that this issue, when it comes up in the way that I described it, comes up with regard to the southwest border. And yet the southwest border is the least likely place from what we know about the patterns and the uh, people involved that, 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 that is going to be vulnerable. But you are responsible obviously for all ports of entry and for airports and you know the border writ large. What about those other areas where people who would be flying to the United States or coming across in places that are less sure. intensively enforced than the southwest border. Well, certainly the the, the border with Canada. Uh, you know, there there are many places. And having worked in both Buffalo and Seattle, uh, there are many places that, that people can come across. I think that's why one, it's so important uh, that we share information with foreign governments and that uh, they recognize uh, uh, the importance of doing that. Our relationship with Canada, in fact, is very good. The other is this idea of pushing pushing the borders out so that if you're going to fly into the United States from Canada, uh, you've already gone through customs and clearance and you've been verified. And when you get off the plane at whatever, whatever airport it is, 
you pick up your bag and go because you've already been cleared. Now, of course, we do that in Abu Dhabi. The secretary has made it very clear that that expansion of pre-clearance uh, in other countries is very helpful. And it's helpful not just from a security standpoint. It's also helpful that when you get off the plane and the line might be an hour to get through, to get through customs, that there are people that have already been cleared and people that can already get through very quickly. Those are all those are all critical issues. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> uh, the child migrant crisis you talked about, and of course that was certainly uh, something that you wouldn't have imagined. I would have, I would think coming into the coming into the office so quickly, I mean, cause, I mean so quickly when you came into office. But I was very pleased to hear you say that it, we should not be taking a victory lap even with the uh, numbers down, and that um, uh, and that there are issues are of concern here. And I, I I think that's absolutely valid. So with that in mind. Um, what if the numbers do start to go up again within the coming year? What lessons have federal officials, uh, DHS, CBP learned? What would you do differently? Well, a couple things. One is that I think approaching this more holistically has been a very smart way. The government of Mexico has engaged uh, in a very strong way with doing better at securing their border with Guatemala. Um, I think many people are familiar with the, the train, La Bestia, and uh, the fact that uh, now instead of 1,500 people on the, on the train, there may be one. Um, they've also, uh, and NAMI, their immigration system, has also set up uh, reviews of checkpoints uh, coming into the United States. Working with those other countries so that uh, through the State Department and, and others that they have a better economy, more security, more opportunity for young people to uh, uh, to become educated uh, means that the, the perhaps the traditional draw of the United States uh, would be lessened. But I think that uh, we want to be very careful about that victory lap. Uh, there is a significant agricultural drought in parts of those three countries. Uh, there is an agriculture disease, coffee rust, uh, uh, that has caused uh, some problems. The gang violence and the, uh, uh, the need for higher education within those countries, those are both, those both continue. And so as the weather cools, and as our economy is an incredibly, and this country is an incredibly attractive place for people uh, uh, to people uh, to migrate to, uh, we're just going to have to watch this very carefully. We're going to have to be uh, uh, more engaged. I would say that Health and Human Services um, has engaged much more forcefully. Uh, many people think that uh, that they could just turn the switch because they're required to take children within 72 hours. Uh, that they could just turn the switch and absorb all these children very quickly. But they do that through contractors. They do that through uh, not-for-profit and uh, grant-making organizations. So it does take them a little bit longer. Uh, that being said, Immigration and Customs Enforcement has also opened up uh, uh, a large number of uh, detention facilities for family units that even though they might uh, uh, not be holding anyone right now, they can be quickly uh, turned on and used for detention purposes. The, um, uh, a couple things on that, but first uh, on Mexico. Mexico, it, it's clear, has become very active on this. Uh, did they become active on this at the behest of the U.S.? Why wouldn't that have been happening all along? I think that it's uh, two things. One is that uh, uh, the recognition in Mexico that um, as people attempt to or leave those countries, travel through Mexico, and then for a variety of reasons that we've kind of discussed are unable to get into the United States, they're going to remain in Mexico. Uh, Mexico's economy has continued to do well, uh, to do better. Uh, the opportunities that may exist in Mexico uh, uh, for these folks is, a, uh, is an issue. So one, it's in their best interest. The second thing is, I think, the relationship that we have with that country uh, uh, over the years and the recognition, the, the clear recognition uh, by the leadership in Mexico that we're all in this together, uh, that we, uh, 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 and that we need to be working together uh, to help solve the problem. 
you know, the other part of this that I'm sure is painfully aware to you, uh, 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 clear to you, is that the supplemental that the administration put forward for all of the costs on the child migrant crisis was rejected by Congress, and now you have a continuing resolution that takes you only till December, and it has nothing in it for judges and nothing in it for helping Central American countries on reintegrating people that are returned, all kinds of other things that are not in it. What are the effects of that budget decision for CBP, for DHS, and for going forward on delivering on this idea that you stressed that um, uh, the message is it's dangerous, but the message also is you're not going to be able to stay here. How, how can that message of not being able to stay here actually come to pass if we don't fund the decision making? Right. If you're given a notice to appear because you've arrived in the country illegally and your hearing is three to five years away, um, you know, in my old job as a police chief, I'd call that a clue. <laughs> uh, uh, th that's a problem. And uh, not funding additional immigration judges, uh, uh, I think, uh, significantly uh, impacts that. So more immigration judges, and remind uh, the audience that that's through the Department of Justice, more immigration judges for speedier hearings are, uh, are, are certainly necessary. DHS has already expended funds. Uh, whether it was for health services, transportation, flights, temporary detention, food services, uh, etc. We've already expended a great deal of money out of our existing budget and to not have that money uh, replenished uh, in, the, in, the, in the supplemental that was asked for uh, means that uh, Secretary Johnson has had to take it, as he said the other day, out of a variety of other places within DHS. So because the numbers are down and because there seems to be a focus on, on other world activities right now, uh, people should not take that as a, as a message that uh, doesn't mean that, uh, that we shouldn't be reimbursed for the monies that have already been expended. Okay, let me um, uh, ask you the last question and then we'll open to the audience. A little bit of a, a, little bit of a more personal question. You've been a law enforcement professional for a very long time. You've had a lot of opportunity at the state and local level as well as at the federal level to um, be involved in law enforcement issues. So I would imagine that you've pretty much seen about everything there is to see. On the other hand, these are very big problems, very big agent, very big agency, uh, very distinct culture, etc. Can you share with us a little bit what? you've experienced so far that's consistent with what you expected and what you've experienced so far that's been a surprise to you. So, so what's consistent about a law enforcement agency the two things that occur. One, if you hire a lot of people too quickly and you haven't invested as much time and effort in, uh, in uh, properly screening them or screening them as much as they need to be and it doesn't matter whether it was here years ago in the Washington DC Police Department whether it was Miami uh, you pay a significant price later on I can tell you that during the time uh, 2006 2007 when the Border Patrol expanded quite rapidly not as much time and attention was was devoted to that uh, the second thing that happens when you expand so rapidly is that now you have people being promoted to supervisory positions, you have people being uh, training agents uh, that have less experience and less time and less institutional knowledge. And then the third thing that, that kind of goes along with this culture is that for almost all of its existence, the Border Patrol operated uh, very much individually. Your assistance, your backup, your support could be many, many miles away and you would be uh, out uh, without that kind of support. Now the Border Patrol works in teams. Uh, it takes a different, uh, a, a, diff a different training curriculum to work in team effort versus working individually. They tell an old story about the Border Patrol and the sheriff in Texas. And he said, uh, and he called the Border Patrol and he said, we have a terrible riot going on and I need a lot of help. And, uh, and a little while later, a Border Patrol agent shows up. The sheriff says, you know, where is all the help? 
he says one riot, one agent. <laughs> and, uh, that was all that was that was all that was needed. So there are all these cultural changes going on in the border patrol. So I would tell you that uh, that that experience in law enforcement uh, uh, is very helpful. The other thing, though, that I that I'd mention, and I don't think anything has come as a, a surprise, other than uh, learning about capra beetles and Asian gypsy moths and and, and all kinds of other things. Uh, I, I I think that uh, that during those five years uh, that I've been in the administration, I had this great opportunity to work so closely along the southwest border uh, with so many people in CBP. And Congress was pleased with what uh, we continued to produce every two years. And we wrote, uh, then we were asked to write a northern border strategy. And it's to bring all the, all the equities together uh, uh, in the Department of Defense, in the Department of Homeland Security, in the Department of Justice, to bring them together about how they can collaborate and how they can work. And I don't think there's a, a better agency that I've seen than CBP uh, for sharing and working. You don't see a lot of press conferences where we stand up and pat ourselves on the back and take credit for certain things. Uh, we're happy to be a significant player and, uh, and in a supportive way, uh, but we don't need to take credit for the good work that's done. Okay. Well, thank you very much, and I'm going to now turn to the audience. Uh, we're going to ask you to wait until the microphone comes to you so that we can get it on the recording, but the first hand I see is here. And please identify yourselves. Yes, I'm Maria Garcia. I'm with Mexican, uh, the Mexican news agency, Notimex. Mr. Kalikowski, um, uh, what do you think that the Mexican government could do in addition to help the, to care the the Central American immigration, and what would be your opinion about the this new policy of the Mexican government to uh, prohibit uh, the transportation in the bestia of the immigrant immigrants? Yeah, I, I would uh, I would certainly not be in a, in a position one the, the position that I hold to say what Mexico should or shouldn't do uh, to be a help. One, I think that, that helping to control and work with that border issue is important for a host of ways. Uh, one, reducing uh, smuggling, uh, human smuggling and the people that prey upon uh, the people that want to get to the United States. So from a purely law enforcement standpoint, Mexico is doing a tremendous job. Uh, they just graduated, as you know, their first class of, I think, 5,000 gendarmerie, um, um, part of the federal police, many of whom will be assigned to work uh, along the southwest border and to work along uh, other parts of the border. So uh, I, I, I guess I, I could not be, uh, having just visited Tapachula a couple of weeks ago, couldn't be more impressed or, or more pleased with, uh, with the work that's going on and uh, uh, the fact that uh, we have such a good, uh, a good relationship with uh, the government of Mexico. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. I'm Adam Isaacson from the Washington Office on Latin America. And I'd just like to know your current thinking about metrics. How is border security being measured these days? There was the, the notion of um, uh, operational control, which was based on apprehensions. And then we heard there was, a, there was going to be a, a sort of index developed for measuring you know, improvements or, 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 or backsliding in border security. And now apprehensions are an interim measure again. Um, is that at all going to change? So I know there are a number of people working on the metrics and, uh, and then you know, trying to understand what is a secure border. You know, when I was a police chief, uh, no city council, no mayor, either in Buffalo or Seattle, told me that I had to have a crime-free city. And uh, they said, are you working hard? Are you doing everything you can to keep people safe, uh, et cetera. But, it, but the requirement wasn't a crime-free uh, city. But you know, many of you might have seen uh, Jim Clapper's comments uh, at the end of David Ignatius's article about the, the role of uh, intelligence, and I think he called it immaculate uh, collection, uh, which, which was important. So let me paraphrase uh, General Clapper a little bit and give him full attribution for this. But it, with us, you know, uh, we're supposed to entirely secure the border. There should be no risk, 
and there should be no jeopardy uh, to the privacy of individual rights. And I would call that immaculate protection rather than immaculate collection. I think that, uh, that our role um, uh, is, is very difficult. I think that uh, it's probably in, in, the, in the places I've traveled around the world, one of the most highly regulated and controlled and protected borders in, in the world. I'm not sure exactly in this wide array of metrics that we have, I'm not sure exactly what metrics will satisfy uh, uh, the press because this, this issue is looked at you know, in such a partisan light. Not the work that the board, not the work that CBP does, but uh, but the fact of what is a definition of a, of a secure border, and we know that uh, apprehensions are down significantly. Uh, we know that uh, for s seven years we've had uh, a stable level of uh, uh, immigration here and the people living here in the United States. Well, there there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of very positive things to say. It's just without without some type of comprehensive immigration reform, uh, it, it's going to continue to be one of those issues that is just buffeted about uh, 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 in the media and and, uh, and by elected officials. Uh, fortunately for us in CBP, you know, I, I've just seen an organization that kind of rolls up their sleeves and continues to do their job in the very best way they can. Um, it's my job to, to do all I can to uh, provide them the guidance and the training, the direction, uh, and the resources to do that job. But uh, if you have a good idea of, uh, of metrics, uh, you can become a highly paid consultant and let me know. <laughs> let me just follow up on that in terms of the issues of perception about border security as well as, uh, uh, you know, what, as you say, what you experience. The, the issue of border control and whether the border is secure is really now with the child migrant crisis come back. I mean, it had been a reasonably agreed on issue that a tremendous amount had been done and mm -hmm. had been accomplished. Do you see the child migrant crisis as a border enforcement failure? I don't see it as a border security and I don't see it as a border enforcement issue. What I did get to see is an awful lot of people coming into the Rio Grande Valley section of, of Texas and immediately turning themselves in, being told uh, if they cross the river that don't worry, there'll be somebody in green uh, for you to turn yourself into. Um, um, calls to 911 from the uh, Mexican side of the river saying somebody is coming across. Uh, we just want to let you know. I didn't see this as an issue of where we were chasing people and not apprehending them. Uh, I saw this, this influx of families and, and children uh, as one of um, a humanitarian crisis. Yeah, I think that that distinction really has not gotten through as fully as it might so um, it's uh, interesting that you see it that way because the reality of this flow has been quite different from mm -hmm. other ones that have been the traditional yeah. porous border other questions Um, Mr. Krawikowski, more a comment and a compliment, I hope. Uh, Pat Byrne, Europol, European Police Agency. Uh, on the international threat, we just want to say and identify, and you've, you might say you've put your money where your mouth is by deploying an officer in our headquarters in The Hague. The EU and the US has similar threats, and we face the same problems together. I think information sharing, which you suggested, is the absolute key to try and prevent the threat and most of all to prevent the young people from radicalizing and going to these conflict zones. But uh, for those that didn't know, USCBP under Mr. Kerbukowski have deployed to Europol and uh, cooperation is at a very, very high level and increasing. Thank you. No, I think your point too that you raised about countering violent extremism is particularly important. Uh, when, when you look at the latest version Uh, quite a bit of information. People here, but also the people in Europe and others, you know, we, need to, we need to continue to have a message. Uh, the joining with, with an organization like ISIS, 
basis uh, is not going to provide the, the, uh, the fruits of the labor that, uh, uh, that young people are gravitating to. So the more that we can understand and recognize that and, uh, and together counter that violent extremism, the better. Hello, my name is Royce Murray. I'm with the National Immigrant Justice Center. I wanted to um, follow up on your comments about um, lessons learned from the you know, recent migration crisis of, of children and, and families. I am sure there were many officers doing, uh, going above and beyond in, in, in helping how they care for the children who were in their custody. However, there were of course also allegations brought by my organization and others here um, regarding you know, abuse, uh, verbal abuse, uh, and mistreatment of these children. And while these complaints are difficult to substantiate given the unique nature of children making complaints in remote locations, um, I wanted to see if you could comment about lessons learned in terms of any changes in policy, uh, in terms of how officers work with children, um, how they care for children in their custody, and of course not just assume that this is due to the stresses of the influx, due, since some of these issues preceded the influx and, and very well continue. I think, I mean, I think you raised two points. One is that <clears throat> certainly the numbers did increase in this last fisc fiscal year, but the numbers, I mean, that's a, I think it's a, a more than double this year, but it did increase in the last year. <coughs> so seeing some of that uh, uh, come about, uh, we've got a training curriculum for, uh, for Border Patrol agents in particular to work on this issue and to, <coughs> excuse me, to better understand uh, uh, the, the importance of, of how they deal with children. Uh, verbal abuse, uh, the cold climate, uh, etc., those were all things that uh, uh, need to be avoided. It's a lesson learned. and. I'm glad you brought the complaints <coughs> to our attention. Good. Thank you. Hello, my name is Angel Villarino. I work for the Mexican newspaper Reforma. I have a question about the juvenile referral program. Uh, according to the Mexican government, uh, 209 teenagers have been arrested and it, under this program. and. I don't know how it works exactly. I mean, uh, there's no a lot of information about this program, and I would like to to know what what is exactly this program. So what we saw is, is that in this smuggling of of uh, families and young people from the three Central American countries, the people engaged in leading them across. Uh, facilitating that, actually involved in the human smuggling, were often uh, juveniles and uh, uh, from Mexico. And so we have had cases in which those juveniles have been apprehended and then uh, they're turned back over to the government of Mexico. What we're doing now is to take a look at apprehending them and then for 60 to 90 days being able to give them some resources, some help, some assistance that, because we know that as long as you're a juvenile and you're engaged in this and you come across the border, the chances of prosecution are very limited. When you turn to be an adult, you're pretty much cast aside. You're back in that country and you may not, uh, the money that you were making doing that is no longer available. So if for 60 or 90 days these kids, uh, can be given some help and some resources, and then returned to Mexico under uh, uh, an agreement uh, that they'll can, that some of this help to them will continue on, uh, so that they don't become just somebody that continues to be arrested until they turn 18, and then is kind of discarded, uh, which is all too often what we saw. Any other hands? Uh, right, right, right. Hi, uh, <clears throat> Jimena Musa representing the Southern Border Communities Coalition. Um, many of us were on the call last week about the new streamlined investigative structure and I think there's a lot of uh, 
I think you saw a lot of positive statements that came out about that, but of course the devil is always in the detail and the implementation. And so I know you're talking about moving, you know, internal affairs investigators to be criminal investigators, but I think uh, some of us are wondering about the way in which these things will go forward, considering there's been a, sort of a cloud hanging over past investigations. So would there be new training? Would there be new personnel coming in that has criminal background or criminal experience, criminal investigative experience, um, and how that, what that might look like? Yeah, many of, many of the people that were in internal affairs had that uh, uh, certainly met the qualifications, uh, but not, did not have the legal authority. Uh, we'll also be bringing in new and additional people. But I think most importantly, we'll be doing a, a, a very rigorous training process for not only some people within headquarters, but people out in the field uh, that can respond quickly to a use of force incident and, and they have the, uh, the experience and the knowledge, they have the support of our laboratory and scientific services division and others uh, to be able to conduct an investigation very shortly. I think you know in the past that uh, uh, the investigations within uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement or even the Office of Inspector General would often be held in abeyance until whatever the result of the criminal case was. We see absolutely no reason that a parallel investigation involving policy uh, uh, compliance cannot be a part of this. So that's where we're headed. And I'm assuming that with that comes your hope or the assumption that these can be resolved more rapidly. From a policy perspective, they can be. As we all know, uh, use of force incidents within a particular jurisdiction are often investigated by a local sheriff, a local prosecutor, uh, the FBI, the U.S. attorney, all depending, and, and some of that takes a, a good bit of time. But for us to wait and then begin our, our compliance investigation until after that is all completed uh, is passed. Other questions? Hi, have you seen any, oh, this M. Sungman with Politico. Um, have you seen any signs or indication that the number of unaccompanied minors will tick up again um, since the weather will start cooling down in the coming weeks and months? So uh, I, I think that going back to that statement earlier about the economy in three Central American countries, a drought, uh, coffee rust, agricultural issues, uh, support from neighboring economies that may be somewhat uh, declining to those three Central American countries, uh, the gang violence, all of those things would tell me, and, and I, I'm, I'm sure Doris can weigh in on this too, all of those things would tell me that we should uh, be very prepared for uh, an influx. It may not be at, at anywhere near the levels that we saw, uh, but I'd, I'd be interested in what you think. Well, I think that you've put your finger exactly on it. The underlying conditions have not really changed. And so there has been a real reaction as you've as you've uh, described with you know working with the countries uh, getting out messages etc but that's what I think of as sort of noise in the system and if that noise in the system once people wait and see and still are stressed in the way that they've been stressed I think you're absolutely correct to be very very cautious about just saying that this is somehow behind us and I really haven't seen that, by the way, from the administration. I've seen one, we're pleased, we're glad the numbers are down. We've learned a lot. We have a lot of resources in place. Uh, you know, so, uh, some other people have said, gee, this is all behind us and it's all over. And I don't, I don't see the administration uh, saying that at all. There was a hand up in front and then one back there. Ted Hessen with Fusion. Um, my question is, with the delays from the Obama administration and from the president on executive action on immigration, does it make it difficult to do your job and for border patrol agents to do their jobs? So I, I think that the president 
could not be more clear, and even, even before I was nominated, uh, because of, of the law enforcement nexus, you know, uh, the chiefs and sheriffs of large departments and others around the country who have been dealing with this all have wanted to see, as the administration has, Congress deal with the immigration issue. Uh, and, I, and I think the president and I think the administration could not be more clear. Uh, how much more difficult uh, does that make it without having clarity? I think that's a, a, a bit difficult uh, to ascertain, but it sure would be a help if everyone knew what the rules were. Hi, I'm Chris Wilson with the Mexico Institute at the Wilson Center. Um, you know, through the Beyond the Border Initiative with Canada, uh, we've taken a number of steps, and one of the one of the concepts embraced in there is an idea of perimeter security, which I guess relates to the, the notion of pushing the border out that you've discussed. Uh, I'm curious about how that might that concept might may or may not apply to Mexico, and you know, I say that particularly in the context of the increasing action that Mexico is taking along its southern border. I know some of that has been supported by the United States. Of course, it's been Mexico-led. You know, does this at some point open up a space to to have conversations with Mexico about perimeter security, about pushing the border out that we've been having with Canada? Well, I think the conversations, particularly about trade and travel and improvements in reducing wait times, uh, et cetera, uh, particularly with Mexico, have been going on. Uh, the president meeting with uh, Prime Minister Harper and, and President Pena and, and others have all talked about this economic issue. And it's to our benefit uh, 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 to work on that in, in particular. Uh, we have a, a, an excellent working relationship with, with Canada when it comes to my uh, organization and, uh, and also with, uh, with my colleagues or counterparts in, uh, in Mexico. So I think that uh, that's going to be um, uh, an, an important part of the discussion. You know, w when I had the drug policy, uh, job, uh, you would often hear there are producing countries and there are transit countries and then there's the United States which is a using country. Uh, and these problems wouldn't exist if we didn't use so much uh, drugs. Other people for years would point their fingers at other countries saying we wouldn't have our problems if you produced. All of those countries that I visited, and I visited almost every single one, we really all have a drug issue. Uh, I visited treatment center in, in, in Guatemala. Uh, I visited treatment centers in Mexico, et cetera. We're kind of all in this together. And that finger pointing about you're a consuming country. I mean, our cocaine use in this country is down dramatically, drastically since 2007. It's down by half, by every measure th th that we have. So we're helpful. 90, 85 to 90 percent of the uh, research uh, that's done in the world on drug prevention and drug treatment programs is conducted or paid for by the United States. These are things that we don't have to sell. We can export these things for free because, you know, I've really seen a, a, a lifting up of this discussion beyond the finger pointing about who's responsible for what. Um, and, and I think that uh, that will only help when we talk about improving trade and travel. Hello, Joanne Lynn with the American Civil Liberties Union. Thank you, Commissioner, for your remarks. Um, at the top of your uh, address, you were talking about the various components for this government's message in response to the Central American refugee crisis. In particular, I wanted to probe a little bit more about our government's handling of families with children. So these are adults, although some of them are very young adults, uh, moms arriving. Uh, fleeing very serious violence, often life-threatening circumstances from the Northern Triangle region in Central America. And it's clear that um, our leaders at the highest levels have sent a very strong message to Central America that these people will not be permitted to stay, that they will be de detained and deported, and that message has gone out very loudly. Um, at the same time, our government has obligations under both domestic and international law to assess refugee protection claims, to be sure that they're assessed um, in, in, in an individualized and fair manner. And often, the very first person that an arriving asylum seeker sees is a Border Patrol agent. 
um, and um, your, your personnel are the ones who are conducting those first line interviews to assess if there is a credible fear. How are you able to juggle balancing both the law enforcement as well as the refugee protection um, responsibilities, especially given the fact that the highest levels of this government are, is telling people in a categorical fashion that they will be sent home? Well, I mean, I think the Secretary's statement that, that the borders are not open to illegal immigration uh, has, been made very, has been made very clear. That said, the Border Patrol being the first in a group of individuals to encounter someone does ask a question about fear and are you afraid. Uh, I think we clearly well recognize that if that's the only time that question is asked or that is the only opportunity someone has to state a claim of credible fear that a lot of these folks are fleeing countries in which law enforcement isn't held in the highest esteem and whether it's through corruption or violence issues uh, among some of those law enforcement agency those often were not the first people that that person would turn to for safety or help or security. So when they come to the United States and they're apprehended, apprehended is a bad word, encountered, uh, because we're not spending a lot of time apprehending anybody. Uh, they're turning themselves in. So when they're encountered, they're in uniform, they're armed, they ask this question, uh, and it should come as no surprise that the vast majority don't make that credible fear claim at, at first. But later on, they're interviewed by Immigration and Customs Enforcement. And any time they can uh, uh, raise the issue of, I'm afraid to return to my country, and that should be uh, adjudicated before they, are, uh, before they ever, ever are returned. Uh, so I, I think we recognize the difficulties uh, of, of that system, but that's why I think we need those backup uh, opportunities and backup questions from others. Thanks. I saw a hand. They're here. Thank you. Uh, Dara Lynn from Vox.com. I kind of want to loop back to the both of you agreeing that the underlying conditions that spurred the child and family migration kind of haven't changed. That seems to imply that the, you know, the message that public announcements in Central American countries that, you know, were being cited as a, a cause for the reduction may not be something that CBP is, you know, sure working one way or the other. And between that and kind of variation among uh, officials on what caused the migration, you know, you saying that this drought in Central American countries, Deputy Secretary Mayorkas last week really pushed gang violence as a major cause. Um, is there going to be a way that CBP and other agencies are going to figure out going forward what really the driving causes have been and kind of narrow down the response. So, I mean, you can go back to the, to the uh, UNCHR uh, interviews, uh, interviews that have been done by, uh, by the Border Patrol, interviews that have done, been done by, by others in DHS. And, and, and it comes back repeatedly to gang violence and fear but it also comes back to family reunification, and it also comes back to the economy and education. Uh, the economy and education being those traditional draws to this country for, uh, 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 for several centuries. So uh, I think everybody looks at it a little bit differently, and depending on their, their point of view, they try to use, or they may try to use some of that information to say, well, it's pretty obvious that this was the cause or this was the problem. I think it's a lot more complex than that, and I think it's a combination of all three of those large issues. Uh, but uh, uh, let me know if you figure it out. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner, for uh, taking the time to speak with us. Greg Chen from the American Immigration Lawyers Association. And I want to follow up on the uh, question and your answer to Joanne Lin from the American Civil Liberties Union. AILA, the American Immigration Lawyers Association, has been providing uh, pro bono counsel uh, from volunteer lawyers who are really just going down to Artesia right now mm -hmm. to address the family detention and deportation situation there. And we've had about 100 lawyers who've taken weeks or whatever out of their own uh, time to volunteer to go down there on their own dime. So it's a very tenuous uh, but robust volunteer situation right now. What we are finding, and the question I have for you, uh, is in our interviews by our attorneys who are screening 
uh, the mothers and children, we're talking infant children that the w are with the mothers uh, who are requesting asylum, that they are telling us uh, that the credible fear process, the initial screening, the questions that CBP officers are asked or supposed to ask them, mm -hmm. that that's simply not happening. Uh, and we, we're getting a range of types of responses from uh, the women and families that are there that are indicating either that the questions are not being asked, uh, that the forms perhaps are either are even being filled out uh, by the officers with pro forma information. Uh, and it's, it's a, a deep concern because that, as you already acknowledged, and I appreciate your, your response, uh, is perhaps the first opportunity a person would have to even be asked those questions is by a CBP uh, you know, person on the, on the border. And it's, it's, it's a critical opportunity to have meaningful access to asylum. And I'm wondering if you could look into that. Uh, there clearly needs to be improvement, at least from our perspective, to that initial screening by the agents, by the officers. Yeah, I, I mean, we'd be happy to, to provide you with that information. I mean, the screeners are, are very well schooled, and I've sat through countless numbers of screenings uh, uh, just to see how it's done, whether it's done virtually with somebody experienced because of the, the large number of people. Uh, so it might be a screener uh, talking on a, on a Skype to someone in McAllen and the screener is at the, in, in the Border Patrol in San Diego. That doesn't always lend itself to the best, uh, uh, to the best communication. Uh, so I'd be happy, I, I'd be happy one, to, to look into that. And, and as you know, that detention facility uh, is, is operated by Immigration and Customs Enforcement. I'll be happy to, uh, 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 to bring that up. Um, but I would also tell you that, boy, when you go down there and you see this, there is just nothing that doesn't, uh, whether it's Artesia or McAllen or Brownsville, there's just nothing that doesn't tug at your heartstrings. Okay. On that note, I'm going to thank you very, very much. I, I guess I should say, do, are there any? Is there any final thought you want to share that we didn't touch on? We touched I've on pretty you many back things. Ten, ten minutes of your life. Right. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you, the audience, for being engaged and having very good questions. Uh, let me just tell you, looking ahead, that s sometime in October we'll be releasing another a follow-up report on deportation that looks very carefully at what the deportations have been over the course of 10 years um, um, with very, very good data, so please watch for that. You also have on your chairs a flyer for the annual Law and Policy Conference at Georgetown Law Center. If you'd like to register, please fill those forms out. And of course, we always have publications here for you to take along with you. Thank you very, very much, and invite anybody to come forward that wants to talk a little further.